This is the banana you'll find sold in most grocery stores in North America and Europe, and it's probably what most of us think a banana is. But if you're old enough and you were alive throughout the 1970s, you might remember a banana that looks a bit different. This is the Gross Michelle banana, and it was absolutely the top banana from the 1900s through the 1970s until it was nearly entirely erased by disease. Why do I bring this up now? Well, unfortunately, the phrase history tends to repeat itself also applies to bananas. The best place to start is actually to rewind into the past and see what exactly happened to the Gross Michelle banana. From the early 1900s to say the 1960s or 70s, what you would see in every supermarket was the Gross Michelle banana. It was everywhere. It was essentially 100% of all exported bananas. And this is never good. This is not good news. In fact, this is what we call a monoculture, which just means that one specific cultivar of a crop makes up the entire industry. And the reason this is bad is that if that one type of the crop, if that one variety is susceptible to a threat, it only takes one threat to basically take down the entire industry. And this is basically what ends up happening. By the mid 1900s, a new banana disease emerges. It's named Panama disease. And unfortunately, the gross Michelle bananas are susceptible to Panama disease. And so it just starts sweeping through these banana farms that are just full of gross Michelle bananas and really no other variety of bananas. As you can probably imagine, Panama disease starts, you know, spreading from one banana farm to another. Over time, it can jump country to country. So really any gross Michelle tree that's already planted and is growing is going to contract Panama disease and it will end up dying, which is bad enough since most of the industry, that's really most of the industry. But Panama disease, if we dig into the details, is even more brutal than that. So Panama disease is caused by a fungus. And unfortunately, this fungus can be found in soil and the same soil that the banana bushes grow in. And this fungus infects the roots of the banana trees or the banana bushes. And it actually slowly kills the banana tree because the fungus can stop water transportation in the plant. Of course, if the plant doesn't get water, well, then it's going to die. So all these banana farms, they are seeing the gross Michelle bushes just wiped out, right? And you can say, well, just replant them, okay? You take your dead trees and you plant new banana trees. Well, they tried that. The problem is that this fungus, it can stay in the soil for at least 20 years. So at this point, say the 1950s or 60s, banana farmers, scientists are scrambling because the whole export of bananas has just been wiped out is just gone and they don't have another type of banana ready to sort of take its place. That's not to say there aren't several other varieties of bananas. There are. There's actually about 75 different species and subspecies of bananas. The problem is that none of those other types are ready to be commercially exported or maybe they're too small or too big, maybe they're not the right color that consumers are used to, or maybe they don't ripen fast enough or they ripen too slow. Nothing was really ready to step in when the gross Michelle banana essentially went commercially extinct. And here, as you may have guessed, is when the Cavendish banana has its big break. It really enters the banana industry after this huge gap left by the fall of the Gross Michelle banana. Now the Cavendish banana wasn't the only new type of banana sort of trialed as the export new export banana, but it was really the only successful one. There was mainly one drawback to the Cavendish banana, and this was that the bananas had to be packed in boxes before they were put on the ships where previously you could just pack the bunches of the bananas directly on the ships. But the Cavendish banana is a little more sensitive and if they weren't packed in this protective boxing by the time the ships arrived, things were not in good condition. 
but this was outweighed by several benefits, including one, it was resistant to Panama disease, what has gotten us into this whole mess in the first place. Two, it was a similar size and shape to the gross Michelle bananas, so maybe consumers wouldn't notice, you know, this change in banana species. Three, it had a pretty similar flavor to the gross Michelle banana. Typically it's characterized as a bit more bland or not as much flavor, but for the most part, it could pass. And also importantly, the Cavendish bananas ripened slow enough that there was time from when the bananas are first harvested from the tree to get these bananas on boats, ship them all around the world, and get them to the grocery store, and the bananas are just about in the right ripeness for consumers to buy. So they don't ripen so quickly that there's no time to get them to the grocery stores. It has a couple of weeks from when they're first picked from the tree until they can get to the grocery store. From the 1970s and onwards, most banana farmers had entirely switched to the Cavendish banana. And each year, 50 million tons of Cavendish bananas are grown, which amounts to about a $100 billion industry. And this is every single year. And it's this set of events that have led to our current predicament because you may have noticed the banana industry simply went from a monoculture of gross Michelle bananas to a monoculture of Cavendish bananas, never to have learned their lesson that don't rely just on one variety that can be very easily wiped out. And the reason I say that is because over the past several decades, Panama disease has also had the time to change and mutate and grow. This is similar to human disease, what we saw with COVID, that as time goes by, we get newer and newer variants that are a bit different. The same is true with plant diseases. They are always evolving over time. So many decades ago, the Cavendish banana was not susceptible to Panama disease, the disease that wiped out the gross Michelle banana. But the newest version of Panama disease, which we call Panama disease race four, where race one was what took out the gross Michelle bananas many decades ago, we now have race four. And the bad news is, some of you probably saw this coming, race four, it can infect the Cavendish banana. The Cavendish banana is no longer safe from Panama disease. For about the last two decades, race four of Panama disease was sort of segregated over on banana farms in the east. But over the years, you know, through wind and storms and boats, the disease has been spread to more and more countries, more continents, where at this point it's in most countries that are capable of growing bananas. It's, it's been spread almost everywhere that no, no country, no banana farms are probably safe for much longer. So the big question now is what's our next move? How do we save the Cavendish banana or can we even save the Cavendish banana at this point? And really this is what got me interested in this topic. I kept seeing these headlines saying, you know, banana has three missing ancestors, the hunt for bananas missing ancestors. And this started because it, during this crisis for the Cavendish banana, scientists, geneticists went back to the banana family tree and actually found out there's three missing ancestors to the current Cavendish banana. So this would be one hope of saving the Cavendish banana is if we can find these missing banana varieties, we could hope, hope that they have some diversity in their genes. They have some useful trait that could be bred into the Cavendish banana and protect it from Panama disease race four. Of course, if you are someone who takes more of a pessimistic view, you could say, well, it's pretty likely these bananas are extinct. There's probably a reason scientists have never described or characterized them. But actually one of the researchers on the project Dr. Julie Sardos says this about her team's outlook. But our personal conviction is that they are still living somewhere in the wild, either poorly described by science or not described at all, in which case they're probably threatened. But you might be wondering, is there a plan B or a backup plan? And there is. You could genetically modify the Cavendish banana to give it resistance to Panama disease, 
But of course, this solution also comes with its own disadvantages and a lot of controversy. That being said, with the CRISPR technology, it could be relatively easy to either cut out genes that make the Cavendish banana susceptible to Panama disease race 4, or add in new genes that would give the Cavendish banana resistance to Panama disease again. In the end, it's not obvious what the future of the Cavendish banana is, or if it has a future. Maybe in 50 years, we will have all forgotten about our beloved Cavendish banana, and it will just be a figment of the past, just like the Gros Michelle.